Hey there, welcome to the Health and Harmony podcast, where your health and harmony is our mission. I'm Chrissy Rice, a spiritual wellness coach, joined by Mike Fave, an independent researcher and health clinician. And to, on today's episode, we are going to talk about how to get a sluggish gut active again. So Mike, how many times a day should we be pooping? What is normal and what is not normal? We're going to talk about poop today. I think, I think at a minimum, one bowel movement per day would be good. But then in my experience, having more bowel movements, so maybe one after each meal or maybe a little bit less than that is, is more towards optimal. Now, the traditional idea or the traditional recommendation, at least when you're in the hospital or whatnot, is if somebody hasn't had a bowel movement for three days, we consider that constipated. Mm -hmm. But when I work with somebody, <laughs> I tend to consider constipation having less than at, at the minimum one bowel movement per day. And then usually yeah. when I change the diet, people are going maybe two or three times a day. So after every time they eat they they have a bowel movement. And so, so that's like the, that's the target that I would shoot for. If you're going less often than that, if you're going once every three days or once a week or two times a week, then I think that that's indicative of like a pretty, uh, of a significant problem because you have to you have to imagine that the when you're having a bowel movement and or when you're not having a bowel movement all of that stool is sitting inside your body right <laughs> so it's definitely it's not a good thing when you start to look at the microbiome and you start to look at some of the bacterial metabolites that get produced and the toxicity that they have you're basically having this sit in your system and it building up in your system so it's really not a not a good thing it, it's not indicative of a healthy bowel. And then there's also, um, there's some associations with slowed bowel and different things with hormonal problems like thyroid issues and whatnot. So ideally, again, one time a day at the minimum, and then maybe up to having a bowel movement after each meal, essentially as food's coming in, food is going out. Got to make space. Yes, exactly. So, so do you find that your clients are going less than they should be or right on point or more than they should be? Or like, what, what do you find most people think is normal these days? It really depends. So if some, it, if people are having significant digestive issues and they have things like IBS or, or small intestine bacterial overgrowth, so IBS is irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. then they can either have severe constipation or they can have like diarrhea all day long, like uncomfortable urgency, all this type of stuff. Both of those are problems for sure. You don't want to be in a circumstance where you're having diarrhea all day long and like running to the bathroom, but you also want to be having regular bowel movements to clear your system out and keep things moving along. So I, it depends on the person, but it's usually, and some people fluctuate even between those two where they are constipated and then they have diarrhea and they kind of go back and forth. All of those situations are not optimal. What I get, try to get my clients to, and what I often get my clients to again, is like having about one bowel movement after each meal. Now, as far as like stool consistency and things like that, usually there's a Bristol stool chart. I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but it, if you don't have like a regular log, that's fine. If you have like pieces or things like that, that's fine, especially depending on what you're eating in your, in your diet. Right. If you're having a, a lot of fruit in your diet and you're having a lot of cooked vegetables or vegetable fiber and, and then the fruit fiber and whatnot, those things actually tend to help to decrease transit time. So they speed things through a bit more. And then that leads to looser stools. If you're having a lot of starchy things and grains and whatnot, yeah. those things tend more towards constipating and slowing down transit time, particularly things like breads and pastas and rices and then if you're eating a lot of bananas or something along those lines, they'll start to slow things down. Some of the whole grain fibers, like if you're having like wheat bran or oat bran or things like that, those will start to actually decrease transit time as well. But they, they're, they do that by irritating the intestine, whereas the fruit and vegetable fibers do that in relation to adjusting what's going on in the microbiome and uh, the production of different things like short chain fatty acids in the gut, whereas like wheat bran doesn't shouldn't technically um, ferment very much because it's very insoluble and digestible. It's more like a coarse thing that kind of moves things through. So depending on the types of fibers and, and compounds you have in your gut that are making your colon, that will change your transit time. Now, when I change the diet, I usually start to incorporate more fruits, 
cooked vegetables, tubers, try to minimize grain intake to a, a decent degree. It doesn't mean low carb. It just means not so much grains. And then that usually gets people to be um, more regular, have bowel movements after each meal. They start to increase their fiber intake in that way because, you know, just like white bread and crackers and cookies and stuff don't really have much fiber. Whereas like if you were to have pineapple or papaya or grapes or uh, like carrots or potatoes, those will start to give you a bit more fiber and it, and they'll start to change uh, the microbiome as well. So the stool shape and consistency can change when you change your diet. Some of those are par for the course. But if you're having like urgency and the stools are acidic and burning and you're having pain or you're having you're straining or you're having a hard time having bowel movement, all of that is not good things. Those are all outside the norm. Right. So you, ideally you have a bowel movement, it comes out easy. Maybe it's a log form, maybe it's more like pieces and whatnot. There's no urgency, there's no pain, there's no burning. And usually you're having at least one, but maybe having one after each meal. That would be the, that's the target that I shoot for with people that I work with. And then X, like having a small amount of gas is, is normal because when bacteria in your colon ferment fibers, they'll produce a bit of gas, but having excessive amounts of gas, tons of bloating, uh, all of those things are usually not good signs as well. You shouldn't really be massively bloated. And the other thing I'll mention though, is if you are bloated, when you eat things like sweet potatoes or broccoli or cabbage or Brussels sprouts or pears or apples, that's normal because those things are high in FODMAPs. So these are carbohydrates that we can't digest. And then the bacteria basically, they go to the colon, and the bacteria have a field day with those, with these carbohydrates. So for a lot of people, if you're eating things that are high in these FODMAPs carbohydrates, then you're, you're going to have those symptoms. And that's also normal. It's normal to get bloating and gas in response to those things. Like if you're to, for me, if I eat a bag of dried mango, probably won't want to be in the same room as me. Yeah. yeah no, <laughs> same broccoli. No, same for me. Yeah. Okay. So those are normal. That's a yeah. normal expectation. Yeah. yeah. That's what our bodies are. That's what they do. You know, it's not abnormal to have that after you eat those things. So if somebody has a very slow digestive tract, it's like sluggish, they're just not having any sort of bowel movements and they're they're just accumulating all this food, but then it gets to this point where they almost don't want to eat because they're so full and backed up and they, they can't release anything. How do you get it going again? Like how yeah. do we how do we get it out? How do we get it moving? And how do we keep it consistently moving? Yeah, so that's that's actually that's a normal response when you when you're really backed up that you're not hungry. So yeah. if you have intestinal irritation or like you're really constipated, usually appetite will start to drastically decrease. So the way that I go about addressing is first I start changing diet. Yeah. So the first thing is I start to minimize things that'll slow down transit time. So grains, as I mentioned, particularly like refined grains tend to really mess up digestion. Mm -hmm. So if you're having a lot of like white rice can slow things down. Now white rice is one of the most safer options. White rice can slow things down. The white bread, crackers, cookies, bagels, things like this will slow down transit time, will we'll kind of clog up the intestine a bit. Not legitimately yeah. clog up, but kind of it slows things down. Yeah. And then the next thing I consider is uh, things that contain opiate peptides. So opiates are like drugs like morphine, Percocet, these types of drugs. They are synthetic opiates, and what, what the opiates do is they have an effect on pain, but the receptors that they hit, the opiate receptors in the intestine, also slow down digestive transit time, like really slow transit time down. So side effects of these drugs, like morphine or Percocet or fentanyl or oxycodone or any of these things, is constipation, like significant constipation. Yeah. Now, there's certain foods that have proteins in them that resemble the same shape as opiates. So they have a similar structure to opiates. They can interact with the opiate receptor. And then those can also slow down transit time pretty significantly. So the things that do this are wheat, soy, and then uh, dairy. So A1 dairy, so that's like usually cow dairy, uh, has these peptides and those peptides will slow down transit time pretty significantly. I, in another episode, we'll cover the difference between A1 and A2 dairy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that'll be important. but these things can drastically slow down transit time. So I try to minimize those in the diet. So we have the grain things, the starch-based things, then you have the, uh, the 
opiate peptide compounds. Now, the next thing that you have is if you're on a high protein diet, so you're eating a ton of protein, you don't really have much fat, you don't really have much carbs, the protein, when it gets into the colon, the protein is actually uh, fermented by the bacteria or putrefied by the bacteria, and the metabolites that it produces are quite toxic to the colon. So the colon, when it's exposed to these things, like I, I'm not moving, I, I'm frozen, like it stuns the colon. The mm -hmm. colon is, is stressed out by these compounds, and then that can slow transit time down as well. So I try to adjust the protein intake, uh, make sure that it's in a reasonable amount. A lot of people usually are under eating protein, but if I have like guys who are bodybuilding and taking protein powders and they're eating a ridiculous amount, they can have digestive issues from all that protein. So protein's a major one uh, as well, so getting that correct. The other thing that you can see is a lot of people eat like really low fiber diets. Yeah. And so you just have no residue inside the intestine. Like you don't have anything to kind of move stuff along. And so excessively low fiber diets can be really problematic for digestive health. That's a big one. Uh, so, and it, the types of fibers are important, right? So the, the grain-based fibers usually are irritating. If you're doing whole grains, they can move things along, but they also can irritate the intestine quite a bit. So I'm looking at things, five, not super irritating fibers, like too much nuts or seeds that aren't really d digestible, but more like the fruit fibers and, and the vegetable fibers and things along these lines. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at, you know, that could be berries, that could be melon, that could be pineapple. So we'll actually talk about pineapple, kiwi, and papaya. Those are, those are things that can help. Uh, then that could be things like potatoes. If you tolerate yams and sweet potatoes, those are also good options. That could be carrots, squashes, pumpkin, beets, um, some cooked greens, if you tolerate them, may be okay. Uh, the peas are usually okay. Sometimes if you tolerate some legumes, they're okay. Legumes can cause gas and bloating though. It depends on the person. Like I do well with peas, but God forbid I eat too much lentils again, you know, yeah. probably want to have separate rooms. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. those are, uh, having the fiber is important as well. So as far as dietary stuff, I think off the bat, those would be the things. So I guess I'll re I'll just go run them through really quick. You have, uh, the starch and grain based things, particularly refined stuff, irritating processed food as well. Some of the like toxic yeah. food as well. Then you have the opiate peptides. Then you have excessive protein, and then you have the uh, making sure that you, you get enough fiber. And then the last one is making sure you're hydrated is important because the colon, um, the stool needs to have enough fluid in order for things to kind of move through appropriately. So dehydration can lead to uh, harder, drier stools. So making sure that you have enough uh, water as well, especially if you start to drastically increase your, your water intake. And then the last one, I guess, as well, I keep adding things. <laughs> I know. I was just going to say that about the water. I was like, you need the water. You don't want it to be a dry desert in there. Like, you can't yeah. move anything in a dry desert. You got to have it, like, be like a river and flow things on out. You know? <laughs> Slip and slide. <laughs> water is key. It's essential. <laughs> yeah. And it, that doesn't mean that you have to, like, chug gallons of water every day. No. But what it means is that if you're thirsty, drink some water. Like, so yeah. what when I you, usually when you have meals, drink water. Exactly. So what I usually do is if people are having juice or coffee or tea with their meals, then what that counts for the fluid intake, although the coffee and tea can be a bit diuretic. Yeah. Um, but then what I usually have them do is have like water intake between meals. So instead of snacking right. all day long, that could be another problem. We'll talk about that. Instead of snacking all day long, have your solid meals, three meals, four meals a day, three meals in a snack, whatever that thing is. And then just have the water to thirst between meals and have your like calorically dense Fluids, your coffees, your teas, your juices. If you're tolerating dairy, your dairy with your meals. And in between meals, have your water. That's usually right. how I put it up. Yep. Yeah. The other what ones. Was that the I, last one you just said. Yeah, the last one I was going to say. Well, the, there's two last ones now because okay, you, you made me think of another one. Okay. Um, mineral intake. So your minerals are important. Having enough sodium, potassium, uh, calcium, magnesium is helpful for bowel function. Particularly sodium can be helpful, making sure you're eating enough sodium in the day. Now, when you switch over to these more whole food diets, you minimize processed foods. It's actually hard to get enough sodium unless you're eating a lot of seafood because most foods aren't high in sodium. The foods okay. that are high in sodium is the chips and the, the, the packaged foods and things like that where the, yeah. the processors add a ton of sodium. So salt... Uh, it can be really helpful for making sure that you have regular bowel movements and things along those lines. Magnesium as well. And the other one I was going to say was the, uh, 
the migrating motor complex. So inside the intestine, you have this system, this, this software program that tells your intestine, hey, contract, move the food, move the debris, move the bacteria, all this stuff down and out through the intestine. And this system is stimulated every single time you eat. So when you put something in your mouth and you're starting to eat a meal, it triggers this to move things along. Now, the kicker is the system takes about three hours to complete one cycle. So if you're having a snack at 11, and then you're having a snack at 1230, and then you're having a snack at 2, and then you're having a snack at 430, you don't let this system fully work. So actually right. having solid meals, three or four meals in a day, allows your body, allows the system to clear everything out. But if you're just snacking all day long, it, mucks, it can muck that process up a bit, especially if you're having digestive issues. Yeah, that's a key. That's a key one. That yeah. was a good one to add in there. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things or a lot of levers to pull to address your digestive function before you have to go to laxatives and, and all of these, these different components. Yeah, I was gonna just I was just gonna ask that to you. What happens to your body? What are you doing to your body when you are backing yourself up and you can't go to the bathroom and now you have to resort to a laxative or metamucil or some sort of fiber supplement to get it out? What's happening to your body and is it good to do that all the time? So okay. So there's a couple things. Your stool has toxic components in it. So you want to get it out. You want it out of the system. It's important that it moves through. The next thing is that your, your liver detoxifies your system through bile acids that get pulled into the stool. And so if you're really constipated and you have a high bacterial population that produces an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase, this enzyme can de remove this glucuronic acid group that the liver adds to these toxins and metabolites that it wants to get rid of, and then you can reabsorb them. So what you want to do is you want your stool to be moving through. It pulls out toxins. It gets rid of the bacterial components. And so having that sit there over the long term can be uh, pretty negative for health, can ruin your appetite, can have some negative metabolic effects on health because you have these bacterial metabolites and, and toxins sitting inside the intestine. It's obviously uncomfortable. So there's a lot of problems that come with that. There are metabolic problems, all types of stuff. So you really want to have things moving along. Now, if you are super backed up, using a laxative can be helpful to clear those things out. And it depends on what laxative you're using. If you're using magnesium or vitamin C or something like that, those are osmotic lax laxatives. So what happens is they just pull more fluids into the bowel to help you move things along. And that's all fine and well. That, that's okay. That's not going to be super harmful to your body overall. The other laxatives that you have are the stimulant laxatives. Those are things like Senna, things like Cascara. Now, it's okay to use those things, but you don't want to use them all the time because they can be really irritating to the intestine, and they can cause problems through that irritation long term. So those are like, those are like... Um, at, like if you really need to help clear things out. Now, Senna is a bit more toxic than Cascara is. The, and neither of them you want to use long term and neither of them you want to use high dosages. But mm -hmm. using those things can help to move things along. The other thing is you don't have to use a laxative like that. So kiwi, pineapple, and papaya have enzymes in them, proteolytic enzymes, so enzymes that break down proteins. In pineapple, you have bromelain. In kiwi, you have actinidin. And then in papaya, you have papain. And these things actually help to decrease the transit time. So they help to move things through the intestinal tract. So you can bring those, those fruits on board, <coughs> excuse me, and they'll help to move, th move things through. So if you, like, you can just add those into the diet, and those can be helpful in and of themselves. And you can use things like a vitamin C, and you can use things like magnesium to also help move things along. And they won't necessarily be super toxic or super irritating to the intestine. And then if you really need help after incorporating those things, then maybe you want to consider adding in something like a cascara. I'd probably stay away from Senna. Cascara Sagrada is, a, is both Senna and Cascara Sagrada are herbs. And so Cascara Sagrada can be used uh, to help keep things going if you're in a, in a difficult time. There's drugs that you can use as well, but I would highly recommend staying away from most of the drugs that people use to treat constipation because some of them are serotonin antagonist or serotonin agonist drugs. So they stimulate serotonin and it's not a good thing to stimulate at all. So I would avoid the serotonin agonistic drugs. Uh, and I would usually stick towards the magnesium. The, uh, that could be magnesium oxide is a good one. 
the vitamin C, the cascara, adding in some of those foods, removing those irritating factors, making sure you're hydrated, getting appropriate minerals. Those would be the, the, the priorities that I would run with first. So if you are in this situation and you start to hydrate a little bit more, eat your, you know, your pineapple and your papaya and your kiwi, how long will it be until you go to the bathroom after you've ingested these things? So what happens is if you have like, if your stool has those toxic compounds from protein that kind of stun the intest, the colon a bit and slow things down, what you want to do is you, uh, that's going to have to pass first because those will really slow things down. And then once that passes, you'll start to find that things will start to move through. So it's once you, if you change up your diet, you do all these things that I'm mentioning, it probably take like a couple days for the intestine to start to get used to this new equilibrium. And then that can help to, to move things through, uh, in a much more, uh, rapid succession than what was happening before. So it may take a couple of days. Cause again, if you're backed up for days, you have to clear all of that out first. Yeah. And that will, that way it may take a little time because the stool that's in there may contain some metabolites that are, uh, slowing down transit time by, uh, slowing down colonic, uh, the muscular contractions in the colon that move things along. So if you're have if you're struggling with this and you struggle with this forever, this is like part of your life. Do you think incorporating more pineapple, more kiwi, and more papaya in your daily life would help to just keep everything moving so you don't get to that situation where you're like, I haven't gone in four days? Especially dried pineapple is easily available. Um, yeah. Kiwis are easily available, and those can be really helpful for moving things along. Uh, so those, those are really easy options. You can eat them on a regular basis. They have carbohydrates, they have vitamins and minerals. They have a bunch of protective plant compounds. So like they're definitely worthwhile papaya as well. Just dry, papayas in the U S at least yeah. usually aren't that ripe. And then when they ripen, they're gross and mushy and they're, they get rotten and then dried yeah. papaya in my experience is like really leathery and hard to eat. <laughs> so I usually don't eat much dried papaya, but the yeah. dried pineapples and kiwis can be helpful. Another thing to look into is hormonal imbalance. So like thyroid problems can cause constipation because the thyroid hormones involved in transit time in the intestine and digestive processes. So being hypothyroid, one of the major symptoms is uh, constipation. Other things is stress, stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, being under mm -hmm. stress decreases blood flow to the gut and it has a whole host of effects on the intestine as well. And that can slow down transit time or speed it up depending on the person's predisposition and the type of stress. But that can, like if somebody's under significant stress, they can find that, oh my, I start to get constipation with stress. And that's because all the blood flow gets pulled away to your brain, to your heart, to your lungs, to your muscles. So you can deal with the stressor, but yeah. then you lose all that blood flow to the gut. So significant stress can cause that problem as well. So again, if these foundational components are organized with, with almost every single person I've worked with, it going through in a systematic fashion and addressing these foundational components clears up the constipation for the vast majority of people who have been constipated their whole life. And that's their predisposition. Nothing's worked and all you get all these ducks in a, in a row. Mm -hmm. And then, then you, you do it in a systematic fashion. You fix the major pieces first. Then you see if you need to use some of these laxative compounds for a short period of time or whatever, see if there's anything going on hormonally, you correct those things and the bowels start to move again and they start to work effectively. Yeah. In case, I mean, in case they haven't been following along and understand this yet, it's building the foundation. We're just going to keep saying that over and over yep. again. <laughs> that is what it is. Yes. But these are specific yeah. things for constipation in the foundation that I would focus yes. on, um, to make a difference overall. And those are the things that I, I significantly help people. The other thing is the low carb diets and like keto and carnivore for some people are the worst for constipation because you're yeah. just putting tons of protein into the colon and creating those toxic metabolites. So a lot of people are like, Oh, I only go to the bathroom once every five days on carnivore. It's like, well, one, you don't have a lot of fibers. You don't have the residue to move things along. So of course, right. and then two, you're just putting a bunch of protein in the colon. So you're really slowing down your transit time, which I think that's actually not a good thing. I think that's a negative, negative thing overall. Yeah. Some of those crazy diets can make things worse. Yes. I couldn't even imagine going once every five days. That's like a lot of, that's like a lot of baggage to carry around with you all the time. Well, on carnivore, they don't have, because there's no fiber in the diet, it's just like steak, salt, and water for yeah. a lot of people doing it. Um, they don't have that much residue in the colon, but the residue that they do have, at least from my experience and from looking at people's gut profiles and things like that is pretty toxic because it's just, right. 
protein metabolites and bile acid metabolites inside the stool. And that leads to like pathogenic microbiome. Another thing is if you have dysbiosis in the microbiome or you have like a chronic latent infection in the gut, those things can all trigger uh, either constipation and or diarrhea Mm -hmm. because of the effects of those bacterial populations. So basically a lot of things that you eat will go in and then the bacterial turn them into compounds that'll slow down transit time, bacteria, fungus, parasitic infections, whatever the deal is. And so making sure that you don't have any of those things going on can be really helpful to minimize issues inside the gut as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. But a lot of times just like fixing up the diet of his dysbiosis will start to clear that out and you can use other things to adjust it as well. So there's a lot of angles to look at here. You have the hormonal component, you have the stress component, you have the microbiome component, you have the dietary factors we talked about. You have the, uh, um, you have the things like opiate peptides. There's a, there's a lot of different components that you can incorporate in strategies to, or levers to pull to make a change in what's going on inside the digestive tract with constipation. And some of the same things go with diarrhea, uh, as well. And we'll, maybe we'll talk about that on a separate episode. (laughs) Yeah. A whole pod on diarrhea. Sounds great. (laughs) I'm sure everyone's going to love it. (laughs) Yes. I love it. All right. So let's summarize this episode for people just to kind of condense it all a little bit. How many, so we need to be going at least once a day. Yes. Ideally. yeah. Yeah. Ideally. And if you're not doing that, we need to look at the foundation going two or three times a day is even better. We have to look at your hormones, right? I mean, there's so much that goes into this sluggish gut yep. that it could be. It's not just one particular thing. It could there be. Are... It could be one thing, yes. but a lot of times it's, especially for people who are really struggling with it long term, yeah. there's usually multiple factors going on besides just like you just didn't have enough fiber. It's like right. probably a couple things. Right. And there are natural remedies to get it to start moving again and to keep it moving. Yeah. Yeah. So the things that just there to recap all the things you mentioned. So we talked about like irritating foods, like grain based things, um, particularly refined and processed foods can worsen the constipation. We talked about opiate peptides in dairy, wheat, and soy. Uh, we talked about the hormonal response. We talked about stress. We talked about dysbiosis in the microbiome. We talked about problems with excess protein. We talked about adequate fiber and specific types of fiber. Then we talked about hydration. We talked about mineral status. We talked about proper spacing of meals with the migrating motor Mm -hmm. complex. And then the other thing, we mentioned that you can use foods like pineapple, kiwi, and papaya because of their special proteolytic enzymes help to improve transit time. We talked about uh, vitamin C and magnesium oxide as ways to push things along in the gut. And then we talked about uh, the herbal the herbal laxatives that could be helpful, things like Cascara Sagrada. We talked about staying away from the serotonin agonist drugs that they use to help people with constipation. And we talked about thyroid dysfunction uh, with constipation directly as well. So we covered a, a lot of things. <laughs> a lot of things. I have a question about the pineapple, though. So is it better to use the full pineapple or dried pineapple or does pineapple juice do the same thing? Or do you need that fiber, the fibers within the whole pineapple? I think some people find that pineapple's helpful. Pine- pineapple juice is helpful. For me, with myself, and with clients, I find that like dried pineapple consistently or even fresh pineapple consistently just moves things along. <laughs> so, and to, to an extent, like if I eat too much pineapple in a day and other people have found this as well, they're really going it's like not they're just kind of going it's like they're going very frequently yeah and you don't so you want it like there is a thing where there's too much you you don't want you don't need to go that much you don't need to be running to the bathroom all the time or anything like that again that's not ideal but it's uh those things can help in in an appropriate amount and you'll have to figure out what that appropriate amount is for you for me i can have you know i was doing maybe an ounce of dried pineapple per meal uh, and I was fine with that. And then I, fresh pineapple, I can do like six ounces, eight ounces for maybe two of my meals and I'm okay. But if I start eating more and more of it, then it starts to, uh, speed things along too much. It does. Yeah. It definitely turns up to volume. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. All right. Awesome. This is a great episode. Where can the people find you, Mike? They can find me at my website, mikefave.com. And what about you, Chrissy? 
All right. Yeah. You can find me on my website as well. It's chrissyrice.com. And if you have any suggestions or questions or comments about this episode or some ideas for some new episodes, please drop it in the comments because we always want to hear what you guys think. And thank you for listening. Yes. Thanks everyone. See you soon.